If you have a Bible and would like to uh, turn there, we are reading from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. This is the second letter that we have uh, from Paul to the church in Corinth, and this is, his, this is just his final uh, greeting, sort of his final farewell um, in this letter. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind and live in peace with each other. And the God of love and of peace will be with you all. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. And may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. This morning, the lectionary text, uh, it feels very uh, poignant for us these days. When I opened it and read it, I thought, wow, this, this seems to fit. It's a, it's a text that addresses a universally known problem, that's conflict. All of us deal with it uh, in one way or another. Wherever two people are gathered, eventually, there will be conflict. So how then can God's people live together in unity? Now that's the question that Paul addressed here in Corinth. Now the church in Corinth, it was one of Paul's church plants. Uh, he'd spent something like 18 months there with them. He'd written at least four letters uh, to them, two of which we have in our New Testament, First and Second Corinthians. Now, there were difficult conversations that Paul had with this church in, in the letters that we have, and we know in the letter, one letter specifically that we don't have, that he was very harsh with them. There were problems that needed to be addressed, things like idolatry, division over whether one followed Paul or, or followed Apollos. There was strife, sexual immorality, false teachers. And specifically in 2 Corinthians, what we've read, Paul was concerned uh, with the presence, but also with the influence of false teachers, who he mockingly called uh, super apostles. In chapter 11, he refers to them as super apostles because these were people who boasted about their good works. They were puffed up about how good they were, how eloquent they were with their words. They were preeminent apostles. But they peddled a false gospel for profit and for power. And they undermined Paul and the work that he had done. They sowed division in and amongst the church in Corinth. They pitted people against one another and they separated them into, into tribes, into different factions. Now conflicts like these are always filled with uh, anger, with frustration. Lines are drawn in the sand and it becomes personal with people. So conversations quickly become a heated, filled with tension and offensive. Now Paul's relationship with this church in Corinth, it was tenuous already. He'd called people out for their sin. Specifically, he'd called them out. Sexual sin, improper worship practices, idolatry, arguments among the people, more. He'd address some difficult issues in 1 Corinthians. And so their relationship could be on rocky ground here. But these were people that he had spent so much time with, discipling them, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And here they were on the brink of division, a fractured people. Now Paul's heart bore the ache of a parent watching their own children reject them while also bickering and fighting with one another. And so imagine Paul urging his, his young flock here to be mended, to be restored again to one another, to encourage one another, to be unified in their minds, to live in peace together. He desperately wanted to see them united, but united together in the truth. In chapter 6 of this letter, when Paul had warned the Corinthian church, he said, 
Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. He was not addressing marriage uh, in this passage, although the implication exists there for marriage. But given the difficulties in the church, Paul's main concern was that they not align themselves with the false teachers, with false teaching. They don't become yoked with false apostles and a false gospel. It would be impossible for them to remain united together in truth with divergent teachings going on and with competing allegiances in the body. So how can this church with its members of various ethnicities and socioeconomic classes, how can they come together all while being pulled apart by different teachings, by false leaders and apostles? It seems like too ambitious a request, maybe even an impossible task for them. But this church was one in desperate need of mending, of restoration. They were not united, but split in their thinking. There was no peace among them because there had been no reconciliation. And conflict threatened to break this fledgling congregation apart with Paul left watching his efforts in Corinth crumble to pieces. A conflict has plagued the church for millennia. It's either comforting to know that we are not the only ones who struggle with the de- disaster that conflict brings, or else it's terrifying to realize that the conflicts that we face, they do not go away easily. It's not hard for us to imagine the difficulty and conflict that might arise within a church. We have lived that reality. We live in that reality. Simply hearing the word racism will make many of us tense up and become aware of a divide. Hearing the word uh, politics, our first thoughts will be anxious and saying, just don't, please don't go there. Aware of the separation. Whoever thought we would see a day where mentioning the previously benign word masks might carry that same sort of power. We are so aware of the divisions the things that separate. And we concern ourselves primarily with labeling one another by our affiliation for these different things. That way we can know which side of the line they are on compared to us. And perhaps some of these things are are ridiculous for us to do it over, but they still carry the potential for conflict to stir up division among us. And there are many other real issues Uh, that tend to bring conflict in the church, of course. And our conflicts over all of these things, they feel much the same as the ones in Corinth. Heated. Personal. Tense. These days, we witness the way that conflict tears at the fabric of our entire nation. And as a local church, we feel it too. Too often, we respond in immature ways in situations like this. Like a child who can't restrain their hand when they've been struck themselves. One commentator put it this way. He said, when we find ourselves embroiled within conflict, we have a tendency to hurl accusations and to assume the identity of the innocent victim for ourselves. Isn't that true? It's so easy to assume that that we are innocent and assume that others are wrong and so hurl our accusations against them. And if you're anything like me, perhaps you nodded along and thought, oh yeah, I can think of a lot of people who do that. But I would implore you to ask yourself first the difficult question, how do I do that? How do I hurl accusations while assuming the innocent victim for myself. While not many of us would say that we like conflict, that we enjoy conflict, we tend to feed it. And our coping mechanisms, they actually breed more and deeper conflict, even if that wasn't our intent in the first place. The anger and the rage that boils up within us during intense conflict, it feels like, it feels like real power. 
We feel empowered by the fury. It fuels us much like the Hulk who quadruples in size and strength when he just taps into that ever-present latent anger. But he loses his ability to be controlled and, and rational, to make real sense of things and use proper judgment. And so too for us, when we resort to anger as a form of power to try to control the situation of the conflict. In conflict, we too often seek first our own well-being because we worry about what we might stand to lose. Conflict feels like a battle. It feels like we're in a fight. So there's a winner and there's a loser. And if we lose, then we will personally lose something that's important to us, something that's precious to us. It could be power. It could be preference. It could be comfort. Whatever it is. And so perhaps unknowingly, Jealousy and selfishness rear their ugly heads to secure for ourselves what we would want. We use dividing lines in conflict so that we can more easily see who belongs with whom, to mark out our tribes and separate ourselves, find a new place to belong, and a growing bitterness against those who are outside our circles makes it easier for us to disregard them to pretend that they don't exist. If I can just label people and put them in a category that's outside of my own, that's different than me, then I just don't have to deal with it. It's not my responsibility. But these coping mechanisms, they do nothing to bring about reconciliation. They destroy unity in the body. And what's more, the bickering and the brokenness within Christ's church, these different factions, They do more than just break relationships or hurt people's feelings. They make the unfaithful claim that we no longer belong to Christ. Something else has taken that ultimate place. Some other cause or some other view claims to be of the highest importance. Some other false god requires us to swear fealty and we've bent the knee. We give ourselves over to that which is not Christ. How does a church like that ever find themselves restored? In mutual agreement with one another, encouraging one another, at peace with each other. There is a way forward, a way out of the exhaustion of bickering and infighting and conflict. And Paul was so committed to this church in Corinth, but more so he was committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he was not willing to walk away. He went back and forth with them in multiple letters, taking multiple visits to see them. He was so committed to their unity in Christ, there had to be a way forward. And this had been Paul's prayer for them. Just a couple of verses before what we've read, in verse 9, he wrote, Our prayer is that you would be fully restored, that you'd be fully mended. And Paul painted a picture of what that could look like, a vision of what the church could be. It's a beautiful community of people restored to each other where those fractured relationships are are mended in a place where encouragement is easily and generously shared with one another, where people together, they're of one mind, meaning that they're focused together on the unity of serving Christ and his mission. It's a place of peace and rest where no one would need to guard themselves from each other. And surely that sounds like a place that we'd wish to join. It's a glorious picture indeed, but how to get there? Like pieces of a broken glass, how could the pieces of this congregation be stuck back together and holes filled again? In short, the Trinity. It would be through the Trinity, a doctrine uh, not yet so fully articulated, but clearly communicated in Paul's unique blessing at the end of this letter. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. These famous words would point 
the church in Corinth and, the, and Christians in ages to come would point them toward the Trinitarian God. The nature of the triune God would inform and would transform the way that they would handle and interact in the midst of conflict. So the way toward unity was through the Trinity. This God could give the people, the Christians in Corinth, what they needed to replace their problematic coping mechanisms and deal with the trouble in a God-honoring way. And the first thing they needed was grace. The grace of Christ displaces anger. It is hard to remain in deep conflict with someone who simply keeps offering grace. I know this because I'm married to Bethany, who is a very graceful person, and no matter how much I try to hold on to my anger and push conflict, her gracious disposition disposition undercuts it. It undermines anger and aggression. Grace deflates conflict. It breeds unity. It's the willingness to listen humbly and to hold one's tongue. The second thing was love. And the love of God dispels jealousy. Conflicts often flare up when we feel like what we have is threatened and we're worried about that. But love allows us to disagree with one another while still viewing each other as children of God as image bearers, people who fully deserve care and respect. So love frees us from selfishness and jealousy, from being primarily concerned about ourselves. It equips us to seek the true flourishing of other people. And in this way, love breeds unity. And the third is fellowship. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit, it destroys bitterness. Fellowship is this commitment to remain with you. To share in community because we truly add to one another. A conflict often arises because of apparent differences that we might have. But fellowship allows us to understand one another and remove bitterness towards each other. Bitterness that results from isolation. And so fellowship too breeds unity. So the way forward is only with the power of God, the God in Trinity. Because God, as he exists in Trinity, he experiences perfect community and unity within himself. He is perfect grace and love and fellowship. And on their own, it would have been impossible for the Corinthian church to fully restore themselves and to solve all of their conflicts. But through the Trinity... The grace of Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit? There was a way. Now, we live in a world of conflict, and it's so obvious, easy to point at in our current climate, but the road toward unity is never closed. There is a way to be restored and mended. It's not through our anger. It's not through our jealousy. It's not through bitterness. It is through the Trinity. It's through the grace of Jesus. Grace that has been extended to us even before we ever had a desire for it. It's grace that led to Jesus' ultimate sacrifice for our salvation from death and into life. Grace that begins to mark the lives of Christians and enable us to listen well to one another. It's through the love of God. Love that came down to us before we ever loved him. Love that would stop at nothing to find a way to be reconciled with you. It's love that enables us to care deeply for others. And it's through the fellowship of the Spirit Fellowship that binds us together in Christ. Fellowship that restores a once broken relationship with God. Fellowship that enables us to see one another as brothers and sisters. And perhaps all of this sounds much too idealistic. 
Sure, it'd be nice. Sounds like a wonderful idea to get along with each other. But maybe you still don't believe it could happen. That it would ever happen. It just seems impossible. And you would be right. Except that Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. All things are possible with God. And our God routinely makes the impossible possible. He exists as three in one. He made light shine out of darkness. He created everything out of nothing. He parted a sea to save his people. He walked on water. He was born of a virgin. He makes that which has died live again. Our God does the impossible. Surely our God can restore us. Surely he can mend us, bring peace among us. And indeed, he has already brought a way for peace and reconciliation for the world's deepest and longest conflict, for the long-standing enmity between humanity and God himself, where in our sin, we made him our enemy. We warred against his perfect nature, and yet God has brought restoration to that relationship. By his grace, Jesus Christ came into our world to bear our punishment for our rebellion. By his love, God has extended forgiveness to us, making his righteousness your own. And by his fellowship, he has made a way for us to commune with him. This should have been impossible. And yet he's done so by his grace, his love, and his fellowship. And these are his gifts to you, his people. One day he will come, and he will restore those gifts perfectly in our world. But until that day, let us proclaim this good news to our world. Let us be a display of his grace, his love, his fellowship. Let us be people who reflect the unity that's displayed in the Trinity. This by the power of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Our God, we give you thanks for your great love and mercy, for your grace, your fellowship among us. God, we confess that often as we try to deal with the problems and pain and brokenness in our world, we do so in poor ways, often making the problems worse. God, allow us to rely on you by your Holy Spirit. Equip us with your grace, your love, your fellowship that we would proclaim that sort of restoration and unity to our world and they would see it in us. We pray this in the powerful name of your son. Amen. As we prepare to leave, I'd like to remind you to uh, please just dismiss from the back rows first to the, to the front um, and head straight outside rather than gathering in our foyer. And if a few of you are willing to stick around and just help wipe down pew backs, um, that would be very helpful. Friends, as we leave, would you stand and receive God's parting blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen.